So thank you all for joining us today for another installment of Passports, um, our virtual series that we started during COVID this year. Um, but today we're traveling to India, which is a country that is near and dear to my heart. Um, my husband and his family are from India, from New Delhi and up in the north in Chandigarh. So it's a, a country that I've gotten to travel to a couple of times on, on different occasions, my wedding being one of them. And um, I'm really looking forward to bring, bringing my daughter in the next couple of years to sort of sort of see family, but also to see what an incredible country it is and, and everything that it has to offer. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the most spectacular things that I've found in my travels is that no part of India looks like another. Um, you know, you can go from the great sand dunes and deserts to lake palaces and dense jungles to rolling, rolling hillsides of the tea plantations and, um, you know, snow-capped mountains, obviously, of the Himalayas and then down to the sleepy backwaters in Kerala. So it's an incredible country of so many contrasts. Um, so much rich history. And I think it's a place that's intimidating for a lot of people. Um, you know, for wildlife enthusiasts, you know, I think kind of doing tiger safaris or even, you know, snow leopard trekking, which I think most people haven't really heard about, thought about, um, you know, might be kind of next on the list, but it's definitely a country that is in the news, you know, sort of for better, for worse, for a lot of things over the years. And so it's intimidating. And so we kind of wanted to bring in Amit to sort of demystify some of that stuff and really just share some of the really incredible regions that you know, we hope travelers are interested in going to. Um, you know, I think a lot, you know, similarly to Africa, it's a place where people have a lot of kind of check boxes of places that they feel like they're supposed to go and things that they're supposed to see. Um, and at Extraordinary Journeys, we really try to get travelers to think beyond that and think about the experiences that they want to have. Um, and maybe that will take them to some of these more off the beaten path destinations and some of these places that we think are so special and so cool. Um, so hopefully this, um, you know, today will be a little bit inspirational, um, a little bit eye opening and kind of give everyone some ideas of, of what else is out there. So obviously today we are joined by Amit Sankala. Um, who hails from a pioneering family of conservationists. And he today continues our legacy through the work at his camp um, in Penge National Park in the central part of India. So a natural advocate for all things India himself, I will stop talking and hand over the reins to him to sort of better introduce him, um, himself and his family and kind of why he, why he does what he does. So Amit, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, I, 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 you mentioned, uh, you know, when you go to Africa, you, you tick off all these boxes and do things. And when we do India, and it's so overwhelming and there's so much to do, but, but it's always good to sort of go back to the drawing board and realize that Africa is a continent and India is a country. And there's, that, is, that is what makes India so incredible is that there is so much diversity in India. Uh, you want to see everything when you come to India. And people ask, Amit, how about seven, eight days and you show me India? I'm like, that's not even possible. Give me a lifetime and I'll think about it. You know, it's, it's India is a journey which takes, uh, where, where you can experience different parts of India every time you come to India. It's completely different from north, south, east, west, any direction you go. We speak over 300 languages, about 2000 or dialects. So if put it this way, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Chennai, which make the four biggest cities of India, speak four completely different languages to each other. So when we pick up the phone and we call Calcutta, or we call Chennai, or we call even Mumbai for the matter, we have to speak English because they don't speak what we speak in Delhi, for example. So the diversity of India because of that is quite amazing. Uh, and in, when, when you go to India, India is something that if you are guided by somebody and people ask this question, is it really important to have a travel agent or a tour operator when you're going to India? Well, the best experiences that you have are so many times hidden. Like, are you going to get a Delhi belly when you go to Delhi? You know, the simple question that people ask, I said, no, if you go with a trusted person who's showing you Delhi in a very different way, absolutely go ahead and still eat the street food and have that experience as well. Or uh, will I be able to drive in India? Well, you know what? Till you have that in your mind that when you land at the airport in Delhi and there'll be a hundred people asking you for a taxi, I'm still in business. But that makes India incredible is the experiences that you have while you're there. It's, it's something where stories bind people, religion, stories, languages, uh, respect, honor, all these different things bind people whether it's staying in a haveli, which is like a little riyadh or a palace, which, is, which descends down from, because we have so much history from the kings. 
put it this way, what binds people? Was it flags? Was it armies? Was it the countries that binded people back in their day? No, it was a story. A great story would bring people together from all walks of life. And people wanted to make their own stories. Let me jump into my story a little bit here. My story goes back into, into wildlife, into conservation. And I'm going to start off by a short video here. That was just a video from only one of the states. This is a movie that released about two years ago now. Uh, but imagine that the diversity of India of wildlife that you saw just in one state there was quite incredible of what is there in the country. My history goes that my grandfather started something called Project Tiger, which established the National Parks of India. He created uh, and the first nine tiger reserves of the country. And my father ventured more into ecotourism business uh, setting up one of the first wilderness camps in India back in the uh, late 80s. Uh, my, uh, when, when they set up Project Tiger, the idea was that they would create these national parks in the country back in 1971 to protect the tiger and its habitat. And they moved villages inside core areas of national parks and moved them into, uh, well, into the buffer areas. Hence, the story of conservation of tigers sort of began from 1971-73 and carries on today to well over 50 national parks in the country. The diversity in India, it's, it's wildlife is spread throughout the country, whether it's tigers, leopards, wild dogs, bears, elephants, buffaloes, Asiatic lions, striped hyenas. Uh, Africa talks about the big five. We very much have the big five. We have even more beyond it. The wild elephants, the one-horned rhinos. The landscape ranges every everything from the Thar Desert to the dense jungles in central India, to, to the mangroves in the east, to the Himalayas in the north. And distribution of tigers, particularly almost 80% in the country, has tigers almost everywhere. But today, less than, less than 5,000 tigers are there in the wild, but over 10,000 tigers are in captivity in just in North America alone. Many of you may have seen the Tiger King that came out on Netflix, shows how many tigers still actually exist even in captivity in North America. But what it says also is that a mother breeds every two years, which means has about two to four cubs. And even with the infant mortality rate of just two cubs surviving, there's actually quite a number of tigers that can multiply very fast if a secure habitat is provided for them. Uh, I'm just gonna run through some slides of, of wildlife images, sloth bears. This is a perfect landscape of central Indian jungles. This is the spotted deer and the gore in a sal forest. This is where Rudyard Kipling got inspired to write the Jungle Book. This is an image taken in southern India with the Black Panther. Uh, it's, it's a very dominant one, and you see them often uh, in the state of Karnataka, where we just saw the video. This is the Indian wild dog, a little bit very different from the African wild dog. 
11 packs similar to African wild dogs, anywhere from six to 24, 25 of them together. Asiatic elephant, Asiatic lion, striped hyena, one-horned rhinos. We hear so much about the African uh, two-horned rhinos, but these are the one-horned rhinos found in the northeast of the country. And the Gardial crocodiles, the Mugger crocodiles, the red pandas found in a place called Sikkim near the Nepal border. And, and the diversity of birds, well over a thousand species of, of birds are, exist in India, the Asian paradise flycatcher, uh, the peacock, of course, uh, four different types of vultures, the tragopan, Himalayan monal. And people ask me, what, kind, what is it when you see a tiger in the wild? What is the sighting like? I will get to that in one minute. But let, let me introduce you to one of my wilderness camps that exists in central India. So people ask, what are the camps like in India? Because we've been to Africa, we've been to the camps there. What do they look like in India? I set up this camp under the banyan tree and this banyan tree is about 400 odd years old. And my, when I was looking for land in these areas, I was walking dry riverbeds. This in the off season becomes a complete river that flows and in, in the winter season, uh, it dries up when we set up the camp around it. Every year the camp comes and goes, it vanishes again in May and it restab we rebuild it in October every year. Uh, set with 10 rooms in Pinch National Park in, in the heart of central India, where we talked about the Kipling jungle. Uh, this is the divide between the teak and the salt forest. And the idea of sustainability was, it was to be the prime driver to of this camp. For example, the, the flooring that you see here, I went to the graveyard of ships of Asia and I collected 20 tons of wood from the flooring of ships and I did my flooring from it. I went to the Supreme Court of India and I bought 15 of those judge tables that you see on the right and I made them my writing desks. Uh, this tent all comes down, the flooring comes out every May and it packs up into the bathroom, which is a permanent structure. So it is a tented camp, but very much with all the sort of luxuries provided. This is the main dining hall where uh, it's, it's famous for its art pieces that are housed here. I went to uh, doors in central India and I collected on the left that you can see these blue doors from uh, various schools and old hospitals and places like that. And I uh, bought about 25 of them and I did my flooring of my dining hall from it. I went to forest rest houses and co collected old chairs and I redid them with leather and suede because nothing goes wrong with them. That's such good construction. Uh, the idea was to have farm to table food. So everything that we actually serve grows within a few kilometers of us with the farmers in the ne neighborhood areas. Now people ask me, you know, uh, what is the situation of the tiger today? Are the tigers uh, dying at a very fast pace? What's happening? Or as we talked about earlier, that there's well over 50 tiger reserves in the country, which means there are 50 national parks where tigers still exist. Uh, if a great habitat is given to tigers, tigers can multiply very fast. And in many areas, 
you know, t tigers and humans have coexisted for centuries. Tigers and humans have actually always coexisted. Unlike uh, North America or other places I've seen where a bear comes into a community, there is a sudden panic. In, in India, if you go to many villages, it's quite common to see a tiger or a leopard or a pack of wild dogs just sort of walking by. Uh, of course, there, are, there is human animal conflict, uh, but it's very much, we do not have fencing around our national park. So the coexistence of man and human and animal has always been there. If we look at what the what is happening today, India is, is a very booming country in, te in terms of industrialization, going towards modernizations. Uh, hence, unfortunately, what is happening, and so it is happening all around the world, is destruction of corridors at the end of the day. Uh, in different parts of the country, these highways are being formed, and their solution to this is to make these uh, sort of underpasses where wildlife can pass. It will take a few years for the wildlife to sort of get used to it, but it is definitely happening. Uh, so one of the biggest cha bigger challenges of you know, conservation in India uh, for protecting tigers is loss of habitat. But, but we are lucky that even today, even after that, we have new national parks being formed almost on a yearly basis. So we are well over 50 project tiger reserves, which means 50 national parks which have tigers in them. Unfortunately, what's also happening within the big cities, as you can see, these images on the top are, for example, from Mumbai, where Mumbai as, as a town has expanded so much that it's gone into leopard territory. It's not the other way around. I mean, the leopards are not coming to the city. We have, as humans, gone into leopard territories. Hence, the leopards are getting pushed out more and more. The images that you see are mostly from the su southern India, uh, where elephant conflict happens uh, in certain farming areas. And all this is happening particularly because they're getting pushed because of the big infrastructure construction that is happening in different areas. But having said all that, uh, I still very much believe that in areas of our national parks, in tourism versus non-tourism area, when we look at it, we are only allowed to go to 20% 20, 20 of the national parks in India. So whether it's a Kana, Ranthambore, Bandhagar, whichever national park you go to, you can only go to 20% of it as a tourist. And the rest 80% is also a secure part of the national park, but tourism is not allowed in the area. But what we have seen that if a park is, let's say, a thousand square kilometers, 200 square kilometers where tourism is allowed usually has over 50% of the tiger, tigers in that particular area. What is happening is that we are reporting, uh, you are going to go away as a tourist. Our guides, our people, our drivers, our workers have every inclination of that tiger surviving. Of course, it's the people that make everything. As Nelson Mandela said, Ultimately, conservation is about people. If you don't have sustainable development and these wildlife parks, then people will have no interest to save them and the park, parks will not survive. Everybody that who works in the areas of these national parks come from the local villages in that area and they have lived with wildlife forever. When poaching happens in a country like India, it's not some outsider coming to do the poaching. It's usually the locals that are incentivized with little money to go kill a tiger or to go, to go kill a leopard, uh, basically for you know, Asian medicine or the bones or the skin. Today, it's very rare that you find uh, that some outsider has come to kill a tiger. A tiger may be poisoned or electrocuted in different areas for poaching purposes, but I would say that in the last 20 years, that has drastically gone down because of the incentives that have come in, uh, especially from tourism, where people have a stake of why the tiger should, should survive. If we see the tiger, the tiger exists. If we don't, the tiger doesn't exist. And that I strongly believe in it. But it's not only about that. It's the 90% it, of the people going into our national parks are actually from India. They visit our national parks. When we were growing up as children, uh, 50 kilometers north, south, east, west, any direction that we went, we always had access to a nature park, a sanctuary, a national park, a project tiger reserves. So from a very young age in the schools uh, and even parents taking their own children would take them to these national parks. In the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. Hence, it's important that we as, as, children, as our children should go to these national parks to try to understand the relevance of why we need to protect nature today. This is a good example of what, what has happened. There was a famous tiger named Ustad in a national park called Ranthambore. When Ustad uh, was take, became a man-eater, unfortunately, because of a human-animal conflict that happened, the government picked up the tiger and took it to a zoo about 200 kilometers away. 
And many of the scientists were saying this was the right thing to do, and it was the right thing to do. But to save that tiger, there was a million people that tweeted, you know, children took out vigils to the prime minister's gate that you see on the top here uh, to say, where is Ustad, save Ustad, because they had seen that tiger and there was that connection to them, whether it was through Facebook images, whether it was through all these connections that people make with social media, social media has given us so much power today that if a tiger goes missing, at least there is somebody shouting about it. Hence, tourism here has played a very critical role. What does it? People ask, what are the chances of me seeing a tiger? Where should I go? Uh, I usually recommend going into central India, which is Madhya Pradesh, which has five great national parks where you can see tigers, leopards, wild dogs, bears on a one, 10 or 12 day trip, uh, very much just focusing in central India. Another place to go is Rajasthan if you're combining it with culture, which is just to the west of that. Most of the safaris are done by four by four Jeep and within uh, within a week or 10 days, you will also take off a very good bird list while you're there. Here's an example of what, how a tiger sighting happens in India. This is a mother with her cubs crossing the road. So there is no, sorry, this is a sort of a phone video. That's a little bit shaky. Uh, there is no off-roading in India. Hence, uh, everybody sort of stays on the route and that's how the national parks have been made. But India is not just about wildlife, as I said. India is, there is so much to India as these stories bind people together we have talked about. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Rajasthan, which is one of the more popular states in India where everybody visits. This is in sort of the northwest of the country. Uh, there are forts and palaces almost everywhere. Every 20 to 30 kilometers, there used to be kingdoms back in the day, which today have converted into beautiful hotels, uh, stunning hotels, some of them incredible history behind them. This is a nine room castle outside one of my favorite cities called Jodhpur where I was born. It's about half an hour out of there in the, in the desert. Uh, this is a 300 year old castle between Jodhpur to Udaipur. So when you're going from one city to the other, don't just look that I'm going to go from Jaipur to Jodhpur, Jodhpur to Udaipur. No, because there is so much history and so much beauty along the way. Drive it, get a driver, drive it, stay in some of these small palaces whether it's the golden city of Jaisalmer or the blue city of Jodhpur, which looks like, I believe, Fez in Marrakesh. Uh, this is the Jodhpur blue, this is my hometown. Go eat in a home in one of these cities to connect with the real people that are there. This is an example in Jodhpur, the blue city that you just saw, this is the Ras Hotel within the city. So like the Medina, as you would call it in Morocco, this is within the forted walled city and you can stay and very much enjoy a a beautiful view of the fort, uh, whether it's staying at the luxurious lake palace or staying in a small haveli of only just 10 rooms. I think it's all about, and I come back to this again and again, stories, stories of real people, stories who connect you to what the life used to be like. As I said, you want to write your own story and say that you met these amazing people that are there. Today, they're running it like small hotels, uh, uh, whether it's 10 rooms, six rooms, eight rooms, 15 rooms, what are they going to do with these properties and this heritage that they have, which dates back hundreds of years? And they've made hospitality a, a focus of this, of how they can tell you their stories, connect you with their people and give you the real experiences while they're at it. I jump to another point here, religion. This is Varanasi, for example, which is very close to my heart. Uh, uh, this is where for Hinduism, uh, we're gonna born here, we're gonna die here, as we say. At any given time in the morning you get up, you can do yoga on the banks of the Ganges uh, uh, in the morning with, with, with the priest's children, or you can witness a cremation 
uh, which is burning 24 hours a day. People come from hundreds of kilometers to die here. That's also the idea. So religion is so strong that in that water, the cremation has happened and people still dip and take the morning dip in the Ganges, that the faith and the belief between people is so strong. I always recommend to go to Varanasi. It is not for everybody, but it's a great contrast to understand religions of India, where a country which has 70% plus Hindus, 20% plus Muslims, 2.5% uh, are Christian, by 2.5 generally we mean 30, 40 million people. So you can imagine uh, the, the extent of the 1.2 billion population of India. But help let somebody navigate you through these waters uh, because there is so much to learn so much to see that happens at odd hours. Uh, here's an example of a small hotel on the banks of the Ganges in a place called Ahilya. Uh, or visit the Golden Temple, which in itself is very beautiful. Just the power. When I, when I took my wife there uh, for the first time and she said, this is more powerful than the Taj Mahal just because it's living. Every day, the faith, the people, you know, people cry when they're there because it's so beautiful. And everything is done in a very humble manner. There's nobody out to sort of get you. That's not the idea. Uh, or connect with the tribes, completely different experience here. I'm here at a festival in the Northeast of the country called the Hornbill Festival, which happens in December every year. Or meditate with a sadhu. This is the Kumbh Mela Festival, uh, where, where the two people on the right who are sitting, they spoke uh, after they were done their meditation. I had four clients with me and they spoke perfect English. They were like, yeah, I was a lawyer in London. I gave up under everything. I, I live under a tree. It's been 10 years. And it was incredible to see, you know, somebody who had everything, gave up everything, and now just lives under a tree and depends on people giving them rations to eat. But the, the faith is so strong, which is, which is beautiful. Uh, this is Central India tribes, where in the jungles that we were sharing images of uh, near my camp areas. Uh, this is in Gujarat, in the complete west of the country, where, believe it or not, that the fabric and the embroidery out of here goes to some of the top fashion houses in New York, which is incredible. Uh, whether it's Europe, they all come down to Gujarat for embroidery, for the fabric. And these are the tribes which have cooperatives which do the work for these top fashion houses uh, there. Whether it's building a camp in the middle of nowhere in Rajasthan, this is the Jawai area where we built a, client, a camp for some kinds of clients because there was no other hotel in this particular area. Uh, and to have those experiences which you cannot have staying in a regular hotel or visiting, for example, a tribe in this particular area, which is a place called Jawai, where the Rebari tribe live amongst the leopards. It's, it's this amazing understanding. If you see the picture on the bottom left, there's a priest who walks up and down the the temple every day and the lepers follow him every day. It's sort of like a clockwork procedure. And it's interesting to see how they've coexisted with being goat herders and also having lepers in that particular area. A similar story exists in the West of India with the lions and the Maldhari people, where they live, the lions live amongst the people. Quite fascinating. This is a camp in Jawai, which is again, if you're driving anywhere in, in Rajasthan from Jaipur to Jodhpur, Jaipur to Udaipur, you can definitely stay in a beautiful, luxurious um, wilderness camp here and experience life as it slows down. So we've talked about, you know, staying in a Haveli, which has history. Haveli is like a Riyadh of 300, 400 years old and the royal family telling you their story. And you can combine it with a wilderness camp like this where you, combine, you connect with the real people, the wildlife, the tribes, uh, and you can do all that within that one state of Rajasthan that we just talked about. Uh, and the diversity of India is quite amazing that everywhere that you go, we just touched upon Rajasthan. This is the complete south of India, uh, which is lush, backwaters of Kerala, quite famous, staying on a houseboat. But again, for me, it boils down to, again, imagine this home that's in front of you. It belongs to a mother and daughter, and they run it like a small guest house. It is, a, again, becomes about the people. The people, everything. They home cook the meals for you, and imagine the view in front of them, in front of their house. Imagine connecting with them. And then, of course, you can stay at the Lake Palace after, but connect with the real people. Uh, I'm jumping here to Darjeeling, up in the northeast of the country, looking at the Himalayas. Uh, Darjeeling tea you may have heard of is quite world famous. But again, there's a beautiful sort of tea estate here called the Glenburn Tea Estate, a beautiful Relay Chateau property that's up there. But then again, for me, it's about connecting with the people.
Husn Tara, she owns the property, runs the property, connects with you, tells you everything about the tea and her family and how they have connected to that. I'm going to jump in the Himalayas here to completely to Ladakh uh, in the winter. Ladakh in the winter is a completely different story. It's beautiful snow, snow peak mountains, uh, stunning views. This is the Shanti Stupa, for example. I really have no idea why my computer started to skip images. But stunning view and why we do we go here in the winter because there is no other tourists that come in this particular area in the winter and beautiful monasteries monks um and having that one-on-one -on -one time uh sitting with the monks in the monastery but my main purpose of going there here in the winter is the snow leopards uh that's a trip i've been running for now almost about 12 odd years when it was hardly impossible to see snow leopards in the wild and today we have 80 to 90 percent success rate uh, that's there with the snow leopards. Uh, we go up to Ladakh, we go up to 3,400 meters. To, uh, the maximum we get up to is about 4,000 meters. And we stay in a beautiful lodge, again, connecting about the people. Uh, there is a lodge which is done by these trackers that are there, uh, that little small hood building that you see in, in, in the Himalayas uh, with very comfortable rooms. And the trip is about 10 to 11 days. You see lamagayas, golden eagles, fox, wolves, uh, snow leopards. Uh, generally on a group, we may have one sighting or you, we may have six sightings. It totally depends from week to week on how the sightings are doing that week. Uh, blue sheep, Ural, Ibex, uh, the opportunity. So if you love wildlife and you like chasing cats, hey, this is the holy grail of all the cats. And I highly recommend that you do it once in your lifetime because it's not just about seeing the snow leopard. It really is a transformational experience being up there in the Himalayas with no other tourists in the area with monks and monasteries. And people ask me, what is the climatic conditions like? Well, it's not that bad. I mean, the maximum it will dip down to minus 15, minus 16 degrees centigrade, which, uh, you know, Chicago gets worse than that. Toronto gets worse than that. You are inside a heated building at that hour. But in the daytime, it's anywhere from, let's say, negative three to 10 degrees centigrade. Uh, so it is, you know, if you're, if you're layering right, you're fine. That is not going to be a problem. And altitude, we slowly acclimatize at 3,200 meters and maximum we get up to is 34,000 meters, let's say, to the maximum. So it is not so bad to actually do this stuff. It's quite a comfortable trip. We're not expecting anybody to a trekker for the, this trip, but more a good hiker walker back in North America. And that would be good enough for this trip because the vehicles go to a very large extent. We have um, about 70,000 troops up in Ladakh areas because it's considered a safe zone. And that's where, you know, hence the roads have been made excellent. So hence the access of the vehicles is quite good. Uh, this is the lodge just from the inside, just to give you a view of what it is.
as I said, it ultimately becomes a story. It's the story you want to tell after your trip, the bragging rights you want to have sometimes. Uh, you know, and that's what a sort of snow leopard trip is. And we've gone through in our little presentation here today in 30 minutes about, uh, you know, wildlife and conservation and tigers and how, what is the status of the tiger today, looking at Havelis, the Riyads, the palaces, the stories those people can tell, the tribes, uh, the tea, the Kerala, uh, lush, you know, India is like a continent. Uh, and, um, you know, if you need, want to know a little bit more about conservation and a little bit of my history, there's a film called Tigerland. So if you ever get a chance, it's on Discovery Channel. Please feel free to watch it. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it, Jamie. All right. Well, I, you know, thank you so much. I, I, I obviously have a, a ton of questions ready and waiting, just um, always wanting to pick your brain when I get the chance. Um, Fanola here has asked if India is open for U.S. travel. Not so yet. Uh, not yeah, it, it's it's not yet open. I, I would say that India is going to start opening up I would, uh, around October. Uh, India's vaccination rate, people keep asking what it is. And when we actually look at the population of 1.2 billion people, it's going to take a, a while to vaccinate everybody. So when you look at the, when you Google, what is the vaccination rate in India, I believe it says 9.1% or 9.2%. Don't look at that. Look at the areas that you are going to. For example, Delhi is well over 50% vaccinated, about 54%. Mumbai is over 50% vaccinated as well. And in all these jungles in these areas, people are fully vaccinated. So we're going there. It's taking its time. Uh, of course, we have one of the biggest um, institutes to make vaccine. The Serum Institute uh, is going to produce over a billion by the end of uh, end of this year. And uh, yeah, they, it's it's more people want to get it. It's just not available as as fast as they want it. But uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine is very much you know everywhere in India. I have friends in Delhi, and we speak regularly, and uh, majority of them are fully vaccinated. So I think they are all on the right trajectory. And by I would say when to visit India, you're asking the question, post January 2022, I think it'll be a great time to start visiting India. And if not January, February season, definitely by October, November, 2022. And I say October, November, it's because the season in India generally runs between October to April uh, is, is the winter season in India. That's when you want to go. And summer season is primarily reserved for Ladakh, that is the Himalayas, in the summer months, not for the snow leopard, but in the summer months. But majority, 95% of the country, you visit India in the winter. Absolutely. Well, please, and you know, anyone, if you have questions, pop them into the, the chat and I'll kind of feed those in. But just, you know, Amit, you know, like I said, I think, you know, for, for some people, India is a little bit intimidating. You know, some of that is, you know, kind of misconceptions and, um, you know, just sort of, you know, what you see in movies maybe versus real life, you know, can you address maybe some of those? What is, what should people not be afraid of that, that kind of comes up um, when you do talk to people? No, absolutely. And, and, and uh, first thing is people think, you know, they're going to a city of 21 million people, they're going to be overwhelmed while they're there. They're going to see so much poverty and this, this is what's going to happen. That's the general conception of people people when they come to India. And I, I think India has moved so far from that, you know, uh, stuck in time ideology that used to be sort of, this is what India is to what India is today. Modernization in India has led not just to development in, 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 uh, in the cities, but also within the communities, within the villages, within all different areas. And it is so very well tech connected now that even when you go to drink chai on the street for literally four cents is the person from the rickshaw is, you know, putting his phone out there and saying, here's my payment and he's scanning it. Uh, so India has actually come a very long way in that. People think that they're going to have upset stomachs. Let me put it this way. I've eaten Indian, Indian food around the world in different restaurants and everything. And I still think that it's, it's still not the right projection of what Indian food in India is like. Indian food is not supposed to be so heavy at the end of the day. It's supposed to be more, uh, it depends on where you are. Of course, we have many different types of food where you go. Uh, but I think the use of sort of the bread and the butter and all the stuff that happens in restaurants around the world that we're so used to eating the butter chicken and not, but the simple Indian food is actually quite amazing and very tasteful and not spicy at all. And I know it's, it's quite or to say that, that isn't Indian food spicy all the time? Is it in all, Bindaloo all the time? I'm like, no, not at all. Uh, I don't do a lot of spice myself. Uh, and yes, my spice level might be very different to you, but there is so many options to choose from. 
absolutely don't be afraid to try. And yes, you're, you may get a little upset stomach because this is the first time you're trying food like that, if you do, but there is no medication in the world that can't cure that. But I, but I let, it, let it pass through your system. Let it pass through. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for, for someone who, you know, is contemplating a, a first trip to India, what, you know, and, and probably, you know, most American sort of visitors have about two weeks to a lot to a trip like this. What do you think are, are the best places to visit, maybe incorporating some of these more off the beaten path ones, you know, kind of spots with maybe some classics that, you know, you just can't get away from something Absolutely. like, you know, the guilt of not going to see the Taj Mahal. No, no, sure, sure. Absolutely go see the Taj Mahal. Never miss it. I, I, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, you know, I, I even had somebody who went to the Taj Mahal on a group trip and, and I, I had breakfast in the hotel. I didn't end up going to Taj Mahal that day. And I met this person and I said, why didn't you go with like the six other people? That went? He's like, Amit, I went to the Taj Mahal 20 years ago. And that is so fresh in my mind that I don't want to ruin it. And he had a great point because there were thousands of people at that point that you would go compared to 20 years ago when he went. But absolutely go first thing in the morning, strike at day, uh, when the sun comes up. So Taj Mahal should be a part of your first time trip to India and it automatically networks into a town called Jaipur, which makes the golden triangle of India. Uh, and it's not just for the purpose of uh, seeing the town of Jaipur, but Jaipur becomes your gateway into the state of Rajasthan. And where I would highly recommend that you stay in one or two of these palaces that I mentioned, which are not in a city. Definitely experience something mm. which is outside the city. So go to the blue city, for example, or go to Udaipur, but break the journey down over the five, six hours with within three or four hours or two or three hours sometimes, you would reach a fort or a palace, which is run by a local family and you can connect with them. And it's still beautiful, it's still luxurious, still all that. If you're doing a wilderness trip to India, for example, and want to combine culture, absolutely do a bit of Rajasthan, I would say spend about five days in Rajasthan and try to go to central India for at least six to eight days, which makes for a good two week trip. Do two national parks if you're not doing more than that and connect that with experiences that I just showed you in Rajasthan as well, making it a complete thing. If you just want to see a tiger, then there's a national park in Rajasthan called Ranthambur, which is ideal for making a connection within the cultural circuit of Raisa, where you can tick off Taj Mahal, stay in a palace, connect with the local family, uh, or see a tiger in the wild, maybe even a leopard for that matter, and, and, and have that overall 10, 12 day amazing trip. But if you're willing to extend it to 14, 15 days of a trip in India, which you should, uh, I would recommend coming to central India where it's a little bit less crowded, more of a close to Africa experience for your wilderness. And there are many ways of enhancing that, which Jimmy can share with you guys later. Um, for a first time yeah. trip. Yeah, or well, yeah, we have another question um, from Hope Smith, who I think is is a, one of our travel agents. Is the Six Senses open? Um, I hope. I love hope. Uh, uh, yes, Six Senses is just about opening. Actually, should be op uh, should have just opened, or is going to open in the next uh, two to three weeks. Uh, and yes, it's one of those old palaces converted into a beautiful hotel and. Uh, uh, I personally have not seen it hope just because it hasn't opened yet. But again, it's in Rajasthan. It's a few hours drive from, uh, not even a few hours, it's about uh, 45 minutes to an hour drive from Ranthambore National Park. So you can actually make a base in that old fort and palaces and visit Ranthambore National Park from there. Um, we are all awaiting to see the new six census, which I'll be seeing in October as well myself. Uh, but again, one of those old forts converted into a luxurious uh, six census name, uh, of course, uh, palaces. In, in Rajasthan again. What are some of the the safest and most unique ways to to see Varanasi? I know it's you know kind of an area where you know it, it kind of gets a reputation for being a lot, um, just a full on assault of the senses. What are some of your kind of tips and and how people should experience that city and to get the most out of it? Varanasi is for everybody. Is, is for any, uh, the experience that you want to have is totally dependent on how much you're willing to absorb Varanasi. For, uh, I would say that when you go to Varanasi, at least make it a two-night stay. Do not go there for one night. It's almost not worth it going for one night because you're going to come out of Varanasi with a lot of thoughts and emotions and you want time to process that while you're still at Varanasi. This is what I say to people. Uh, the, the usual thing is to go and do 
uh, the Aarti, which is the prayers in the evening where there will be boats and people trying to see the Aarti in the evening that for hundreds and thousands of years they've done this prayer and it just carries on, uh, rain or shine, it happens. And first thing in the morning, you get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning and take those that boat on the Ganges and see the city waking up, which is also beautiful and seeing people pray on the banks of the Ganges, taking their morning dip, seeing the morning prayers, all that is very powerful. But spend the time in the day to walk through the city and hear the mysticism of the city, of, of the tales and, 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 and the stories that are behind it. Uh, if you want to take it to the next level, we have a walk, which is uh, the, the death and rebirth walk, which starts at 8 p.m., ends at midnight. Now, it's a little bit, you know, uh, time extreme, but it's an attack on the senses. And it's not for everybody. It's for people who are ready to sort of see the next extent of, uh, you know, Hinduism, to be honest. Uh, I'm not kid going to kid you, but you might meet uh, cannibals, for example. You might meet Dom Raja, who's known as the king of death, for example, uh, who, whose fire in his house has burnt every fire in the cremation gods of Varanasi, uh, which is super powerful because they say Lord Shiva lighted fire in that house a gazillion years ago. Uh, are you ready for those kind of stories? And that walk ends at midnight with a prayer at 11.30 p.m. in a small temple uh, on the banks of the Ganges, when they ring the bells, it seems like an earthquake is coming, but there is only 10 people there and it's so local that it's powerful. But again, you know, Varanasi is up to, I want to know you as a client and I know where you have been. You tell me I've been to Peru and stayed there and Africa, you went to Botswana and I've traveled to well over 60 countries and I'll tell you that you've never seen anything like this before in your life. Anyways, my passion for Varanasi is a different level. <laughs> I love it. Um... Uh, another question on here, you know, if, if someone has been on safari, how would you, sorry, safari in Africa, I mean, um, how would you ex compare the experience to safari in India? And and maybe what are some tips for people to enhance that experience? Are there, yeah. you know, specific like permits that you can get, for example, that, sure. you know, would very, maybe... Very different, uh, from the, yeah, very different from the safari experience in, in Africa. All our national parks are sort of governed by the government. And these are the national parks where my grandfather was the head of Project Tiger. So it comes all under Project Tiger and all the private lodges and everything, sort of like what you see in, in Uganda and other places are outside the national park. Nobody's inside the national park in India, but we sit right on the periphery of the national park and there is no boundary. I mean, of course, there is a physical boundary by stones to say this is the boundary, but there's no fencing and the wildlife moves in and out in both places. Um, you go in the morning and uh, at right at sunrise and you come out at 10.30 in the morning, you go again around 2.33 p.m. in the afternoon and you come back around sunset. So times are governed. It's not like you can go everywhere inside the park just because, you know, if everybody tries to go where the tiger sighting was this morning, there will be a huge crowd. Hence, everybody is going to given a zone or a route that they go on and tigers are sort of present almost everywhere. Uh, in, in different areas. And then it's up to you how good your naturalist, how, how good your guides are, uh, all those things matter. To enhance this experience, you can get something called a full day permit, which gives you exclusive access. Uh, and you go in 15 minutes before everybody in the morning, you are in the park all day and you come out 15 minutes after everybody in the evening, and you can go anywhere you like in that 20% of area that's open to tourism. Let me tell you why this makes a big difference. The tigers usually move at night. They move on the, the sandy roads that are there. And in the morning, the first vehicles that come up on them, they're usually still sitting on the road. And being the first there, it actually matters and makes a big difference. When everybody has to leave, let's say at 9.30 a.m. to 10 a.m., and has to leave the park and you're at an amazing site, tiger sighting, say like mother and cubs are sitting by a water hole, they all have to leave. You're the only person in the park for the next few hours. And whatever sightings happen in that area is yours to govern. And if you think a sighting happened in a different zone, different group, go right ahead, you know, because you have that exclusive permit. And that makes it so much more worth it and closest to Africa experience, as I say. You take your lunch with you. Um, and there is also one more point I will touch upon is elephants in India. And there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, elephants shouldn't be ridden and absolutely shouldn't be ridden. Uh, you know, places like Jaipur and all that do that for the fort. I would never advise to do that because that is quite cruel. But in central India, uh, elephants had all been always been used for a conservation purpose. It was used that there were many areas that we as humans can't just walk into dense jungles. Uh, and that's where elephants are sort of called to protect uh, and, and take the mahouts into deep jungles for conservation purposes. And that's how patrolling is done and how it has always been done in central India. 
um, when tigers move into villages, it's very hard for humans to just go there and say, move the tiger out. That's when the elephants are called to drive the tiger back into the jungle. That's the idea. And this almost is happening on a weekly basis. If you have the full day permit, you can spend a little bit more money and you can go on the elephant uh, with the mahout for patrolling purposes. Uh, it's not such a tourism thing. It's more for the patrolling with the elephant. 95% of the time, they're patrolling a tiger that they already know. And hence, you get the opportunity with the tiger. Slowly over time, I think they will phase out the elephants and not bringing any new elephants. Hence, whatever elephants are born in captivity sort of just carry on. But that's the purpose of elephants in central India. And this is a question that comes up a lot. Hence, I thought I'd just address it right there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what a you know, enhancement can happen. I think sort of, you know, what's what's on everyone's mind for, you know, people who have been to India before, um, you know, you touched a little bit about seasonality and kind of, you know, the probability of seeing tigers, but it doesn't always, it's it's not always a, a, a guarantee. What is, with that in mind, obviously, because wildlife is wildlife, what are, you know, what are your, your, your best recommendations for the best months and the best places to see those tigers for someone who has tried a couple times and, and hasn't hasn't made it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I still highly recommend that between the national parks that I would recommend to see tigers, Ranthambore being the one in Rajasthan where everybody goes to, the, the difference in Ranthambore and the other national park is just because it sits such a, on a proximity to the Golden Triangle of India or Delhi, it's great to tick it off if you just want to see a tiger, but that also, it's a victim of its own success. Because of that, it's quite crowded. You can have bigger canters, which have 20 people seated in them, 10 people seated in them, and jeeps as well, all you know, trying to see a tiger, they have also divided the roots and zone, but excellent uh, density of tigers in Ranthamore in Rajasthan, for sure. Other than that, for an overall experience, I highly recommend to go to Central India, to Bandhavgarh, Kana, Pench, these areas in Central India of Madhya Pradesh, and I would spend two parks about three nights each. Um, usually, 95% of the time, you're definitely going to come out with a tiger sighting. Uh, many times, you'll come out with 15 tiger sightings. It totally depends on the time. People ask me, is there a breeding time for tigers that should be there? No, that concept has gone out the door with the climate change, I think. It's it just, everything is you know, twisted around to us just saying that's when that happens because it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, November is a great time to see tigers. Uh, February, March, April, excellent time to see tigers as well, just because as the heat grows up, the water holes become more populated by wildlife coming to them regularly. But always remember that we are restricted on road where we go to see tigers, where the water holes are. Sometimes the water holes are much inside, which you can't go to as well. So ideally, there is no single time, but February, March, and November, definitely great months. If you're able to take the heat, then April is a great time. And by heat, I mean it will get up to 40 degrees centigrade by mid-April. So it starts to get really hot. Uh, December, January, amazing time for photography in, for different purposes because the misty mornings happen over the grassland with the Barasinga antlers standing up, which sort of the scenes that you see sometimes in Yellowstone as well, people photograph things like that. Uh, and the tigers sunbathing, you know, in, in the open grassland. So it completely different, depends what type of uh, an experience you are after. So if I was going to say December and January are bad months, they're not. You know what's a bad time to come? It's Christmas, New Year's generally in the national parks because it's so crowded. Uh, mm -hmm. Or the festival of Diwali and Holi, which is amazing to have you know, in a, a city or a small palace. But if you leave those three days alone, don't go to the national parks in those three days, go the week after or the week before because Indians love their holidays and <laughs> crowds all the parks because of that. And every VIP in the world is at them, which we can't control. So if you can avoid the holidays, that's a good time to come see a tiger. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's that's excellent advice. I think, you know, we're kind of coming close to the end of the hour mark. So I um, want to wrap it up here. Obviously, you know, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, you know, as always with these presentations, we've been recording it and we'll send out the recording, you know, for reference or for people who weren't able to make it live today. Um, and we'll also obviously, you know, send some follow-up itineraries, some suggestions, ideas, um, you know, as you kind of think about planning that trip to India, you know, as Ahmed said, kind of looking towards the end of, of 2022, if you're looking to go on safari um, or any time after, just, you know, getting getting in there and, and getting getting those permits in advance is, is a big thing. So please do reach out. There's no such thing as too early. 
Um, and as we go, I just kind of, you know, want to remind everyone we have another Passports coming up um, September 23rd with the head of Singita Group's creative design team about architecture and interior design of safari camps. So some of these, you know, beautiful camps that you see around Africa, um, you know, she's sort of the, the person who's made that happen, which is really, really cool to be able to pick her brain and sort of get some of that insight. So Amit, thank you so much um, for, for giving us your time today and your insights and your expertise as always. Um, and Amit, you know, is sort of the, the face behind a lot of a lot of our planning for trips to India. So, you know, you've met him today. You're very much in good hands working with Extraordinary Journeys um, and kind of our partners in, in Amit and Encounters Asia. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, Amit. Bye-bye. <laughs>